Hello, it's Dawn, and this is Dawn Versations. I'm so happy to have you here. We talk about anything and everything. It's just a potpourri of topics, and that's just the way I like it. If you like surprises and you like variety, this is the show for you. Let's go. Welcome to another episode of Dawn Versations. Hello, Bill, and welcome to the show. Thank you for being here today. Hi, Don. Thanks for having me. Yes. So I found Bill on a, a podcaster's page um, where we look for guests. And I was looking for people that have written books and are entertaining. And he sent me his bio. But what kind of stuck out to me is that you have been sober for a really long time. And mm -hmm. I did a podcast episode a while back about how I just went sober back in September. I want to talk about it because it's something that it is not really talked about a lot by a lot of people and we are kind of surrounded with it. it it's on, on commercials. It's, you know, like celebrations. So how do you celebrate now that you are sober? What do you do to celebrate things? Well, first off, I miss bloody Mary's at brunch, <laughs> but you know, you can still have a virgin bloody Mary and it's, it's just as good. What I do, you know, I'm, I'm 27 years clean and sober as of April 18th, um, there but for the grace of God, so I. I tried to get sober in 1987, and I tried to get sober in 1977 when I was 17 years old, and I was struck sober on April 18th, 1997. It was definitely divine, um, and, and I can talk more about that. But in regards to how I celebrate, it's, you know... I'll go to parties. Um, I go to I'll I'll meet people at a bar if you know if they're supposed to you know if if I'm meet if I'm supposed to be there for a purpose. Um, I just never forget what the hangovers were like, what the what we called in Boston where I got sober we would call them jackpots when like you'd crash a car or you'd black out and not remember what you said the night before. They're yeah. called jackpots. Funny. And I can wake up every morning without a hangover. And when I go out to places, I don't, you know, if I'm at a bar and everyone's heavy drinking or at a party and they're heavy drinking, there's that point that you reaches where it starts off nice and quiet and all of a sudden everybody gets really loud and you start listening to the conversations when you're sober. And they're, a lot of times they're pretty idiotic. Yeah. Um, you know, where you're just like, really? I can't talk to this person. And now they're crying. And they were just laughing a minute ago, you know, I, I once in a great while, I'll have a non-alcoholic beer, but rarely they're better now than they used to be. But I'll have, yes. you know, I'll have a ginger ale with cranberry and nobody knows I'm not drinking, you know. And when it's always funny because the people that do have problems with their drinking will find me and they'll be like, hey, I hear you <laughs> don't drink. I've thought about doing that. And I'm like, oh, no. So I'll talk to them. And, you know, and I offer up my phone number. And listen, if you want to talk about it, because you don't want to pressure anybody into anything. Because I do believe you have to be willing to change. And the hardest part for me was uh, I was writing also at the time. And I was smoking a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. I was drinking. Um, I was smoking a lot of weed. I, I had gotten into cocaine and I was running staffing for one of the largest investment firms in the United States. Jeez. Now, I wasn't doing it at work. No <laughs> one knew I had a problem, but the hole inside of me just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And like I said, I had always I tried to quit drinking many times. And different situations happened where I started using again. None of my friends would call me on it. Nobody said, Bill, you might have a problem. Even though I would black out and crash a car because I was successful. And I was a good guy. But, I, you know, you know when you black out. Normal drinkers don't black out. They just don't, you yeah. know. Yep. And there is a difference between an alcoholic and a heavy drinker. Mm -hmm. a heavy drinker, somebody might say to them, a loved one, you know what, you're drinking too much. Or you recognize, you know, I'm just drinking too much. And then you stop or you cut back. An alcoholic, it's a disease of the mind. You know, it's never enough. It's the disease of more. 
got to have more, got to have more, got to have more when I'm feeling depressed, got to have to have more when I'm feeling good. You celebrated, you did all these things. And it's be, it's about being rigorously honest yeah. with how you're living your life. And it is the best thing I've ever done was getting clean and sober. It really was um, yeah. the number one thing. But I was struck sober. It's a kind of a long story that I don't have to go into now, but maybe another time. But um, it, of how it unfolded. But I literally woke up that day and knew I couldn't drink anymore and didn't know what to do. Were you drunk the night before? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I was in my business suit. It, the sad thing, my last drink were seven white Zinfandals. And I don't even like white Zinfandals. And there was some Coke involved and some pot. And, uh, you know, and uh, you, you and, and my behavior was not something that I would do today. Um. You know, I've always worked two careers. I was in corporate America for a long time. And at the same time, I had a um, more of an arts background. So, you know, I've sold a couple of scripts to Lifetime and they've produced um, an aired one. I used to write for National Lampoon magazine. I ran a sketch comedy show out of New York and out of Boston and out of L.A. And the whole time I was still working in corporate America. Wow. You know, because after 97, when I got sober... I, I left that big company and went to work for a friend of mine who started um, a dot com and I was a corporate recruiter. So ever since 97, I've been working remotely. And then 2020 kicked in and COVID and I got laid off from my last job and I'm older now. So I got kind of aged out and I had never taken unemployment in my life. And I started yeah. working when I was 15 and I'm now 63. So I decided over COVID, I'm going to take the unemployment. I've been paying into it forever, but now there's a gap in my resume. So mm. corporate America doesn't like gaps. Yeah. So now I'm just writing and producing full time. Um, I feel like I've, um, I'm, I'm, I'm changing yet again. You know, I heard someone say, when you're in a state of confusion, it means that that's a spiritual state because one paradigm is dying and a new paradigm is evolving and you're caught in that place of it's uncomfortable. Oh. So I had to become uncomfortable. I had to become comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And now the new paradigm is getting me to surrender, you know? And if I was drinking, I'd be trying to control the whole thing. Right. Right. So I, uh, this just popped into my mind. Do you feel like your creativity is better sober? Do you wonder how you, if you, do you feel like you were really creative in spite of the alcohol? Well, when I first got sober, I mean, I wrote a lot of sketch comedy. I wrote for this PBS kids show. I wrote for National Lampoon, short stuff. When I got sober, I wanted to be able to write a screenplay because I couldn't focus longer than Mm -hmm. a 10 minute sketch mm -hmm. you know so i wrote my first screenplay in my first year i've optioned it like four times we might make it after um the next film that we're working on it helped me to focus more that was the biggest fear when i quit am i ever going to be able to be funny again i think i'm funnier now and when it comes to writing yeah because I've experienced a lot of things mm -hmm. you know there was an old saying you're not even funny till you're 40 you know <laughs> I get sober at 36. So, um, and, and I do believe that like the average age of a film director in Hollywood before 1969 was 58 years old. That was wow. the average age. And then a whole young crop came in, but they wanted people that old because they had life experiences. Yeah. yeah. You know, and now being 63 and I have a lot of friends in that age group. I've already lost friends that have died um, mm. in their early 60s, late 50s. I mean, a lot. And and I went through the AIDS epidemic of the 80s where I lost yeah. a lot of people in their 20s and 30s. So as I've gotten older, I realize we're not here that long. Yeah. I don't want to spend it being clouded from alcohol and drugs. I don't even take, knock on wood, I don't even take a prescription drug right now. I'm not on anything. And I I want to keep it that way yeah. for as long as I can. Yeah. 
when I have friends that are going through trouble, especially marriages, whether they're straight or gay, and there's a problem going on, first question I ask, is one of you drinking? Because 90% of the time, whenever I hear, yeah, I drink too much or my partner mm -hmm. drinks too much and it's an issue, it's that and money. Yeah. What I've experienced. I'm yeah. sure you know, experts would say something else. But I just am like, because people, you know, like when people say when someone's drunk, that's who they really are. No, it's not. Right. No, it's the total opposite. Yeah. It's the fears coming out. It's their, you know, they don't want to feel life. Yeah. That's really what it's about. They don't want to feel life. I mean, my own personal opinion, I can't smoke pot. I wish I could, but it would lead me back to the other. But I think marijuana is far less, you know, harmful than alcohol. Mm -hmm. Alcohol actually eats the hip bones. Elizabeth Taylor, <laughs> Liza Minnelli, all these people had hip operations. Oh my God. I never Google realized it. That. <laughs> Put it into AI. How many celebrities have lost their hips? You know, I mean, you could do that, but yeah. it, it, it does. It eats the bone. Wow. You know, look at all the commercials that we see about it. And I mean, you know, just watching, watching football games where a team wins and they're tipping over cars and lighting things on fire. <laughs> I don't think they're all sober. The odds are good. Yeah. Sober. Right. It's it, yeah, but it, it is so normalized, but it's not good that it's normalized for the people that can't handle it. And it, and I never heard that correlation of being an alcoholic or did you say a problem drinker? Is that what no, they, uh, yeah, it could be a problem, but it's a heavy drinker. It's what drinker. They call it. So I totally relate to the more. That's why I haven't had another one because I know my personality. I'd be like, oh, that was delicious. I'll have 18. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't go to a party if I knew that there wasn't going to be any alcohol there unless I could make sure I brought it. I always had a bag of pot on me. I was the guy, you know, and I started when I was 12. I had my first drink when I was eight. Oh, my but God. I started, yeah, I started heavy drinking when I was 12. And, uh, and, you know, I made it through college. My parents almost put me in a military um, academy. <laughs> My dad <laughs> went in on D-Day. He was a big military guy. Yeah. Um, and, and his family had a drinking problem. And my mom's family had a drinking problem. My sister has no problem with drinking. My mom really didn't. And my dad was told when I was 12, he had a heart attack. And, and they told him, you can't drink anymore. And he just put it down. But as he got older, they told him he could have a glass of red wine. Oh, he'd be watching the clock. <laughs> he'd, he'd fill that thing to the brim. He was like, Bill, look, I'm having my port. You know, and I'm like, okay, great, Dad. Thank God you're not like really over the top. Oh, but, my God. Yeah, it was very, it was interesting. But all of his brothers died of alcoholism. That was mm -hmm. four of them. And his, and his father. So they were from Scotland. He was from Glasgow. So okay. They drink and play soccer. It's been an interesting ride. Thank God for Zoom. I do a lot of Zoom AA because over COVID, it kept a lot of people sober. And a lot of people got sober on Zoom. You know, like AA meetings, NA meetings, yeah. CA meetings, whatever. Um, so we call them Zoom babies. <laughs> and, and I'm on a men's meeting with about, there's about 40 guys all together. But there's usually no more than like 12 or 15 on each call because it runs daily. And what I hear people that are brand new coming in, it just tears at my heart because I remember being in that place where it had taken over my life. Yeah. You can't and picture it, uh, your life without it. No, the hard drugs I actually am thankful for because that dropped me a lot faster. The last six months of my using, um, you know, cocaine was heavy. And and that dropped me. And I left my job. Nobody knew I had a problem. Um, you know, um, I went into an evening rehab because I had to work during the day, you know, because I'm a holic. Yeah. Whether it's alcoholic or workaholic. Yeah. And um, and then I left completely and and my life shifted. But I was anyone who gets sober needs to sit down and remember they're doing it because they love themselves. And they love their family and friends. You know, 
that's what I think a lot of people forget. You know, it's like pat yourself on the back for showing up for life. Yeah. So you did, you quit the two times and then the third time was the charm for well, you. Well, the first time was 1977. I was 17 years old or 16. I went to an AA meeting, was in the basement of a church. It was mostly all older white guys. Um, and they dragged in this old drunken woman who was screaming and crying. And I went right out and bought a six pack of Lowenbrow. <laughs> and I went out for another 10 years. Then in 1987, I was in corporate America. I was working as a headhunter and I went to a barbecue. And um, this guy made chicken salad with his hands and he had hepatitis. So 10 of us caught hepatitis. Oh. And and I was at a Red Sox game because I was from Boston and I was with a friend of mine and he didn't want to drink much. So he would take sips off my beer, and which was annoying because I wanted to drink my beer. Well, he got hepatitis also, 10 of us. And it was bad. It was bad. I almost, you know, I almost died. They what? told me and they literally said to me, Bill, if you drink again, you will die. So I convinced myself for a year and a half, if I have one drink of alcohol, I'm dead. So I'd go to some AA meetings, not many, maybe like two. I'd sit in the back, usually high, because I'd smoke a joint, because I'd smoked a lot of pot over that time period, all right? And, um, and then I was, out, um, I was out with some friends at a club, and one of them said to me, Bill, what do you want to drink? And I said, I'll have a Perrier with a lime because that's what you drank in 1987 if you were sober. <laughs> and he tapped me on the shoulder and handed me a Heineken. And I went out for another 10 years. Uh, it was that fast. That fear of my dying was superseded by my having five Heinekens that night. Gosh. So I went out for another 10 years. And, you know, ups and downs. My career took off. I was making a lot of money. And and yet that hole kept getting bigger and bigger. And then jackpots were happening where I got I got my apartment ransacked. I got carjacked. I got held up at a payphone at knife point. I saw a 16-year-old boy shot and killed on the streets of Boston. I was sober, but the karma was bad. And I was in my car, and he was standing on the sidewalk right across from me. Oh, and I saw, I saw the kid walking toward him. And I looked to the right for the oncoming traffic, and I heard that pop noise, and I turned to the left, and the kid was now on the ground bleeding. And there were like 80, no, there were 90-some-odd murders in Boston that summer. Oh, okay. my. And then my apartment's ransacked and all these, and it's probably somebody I was doing drugs with. It was all this bad karma. I was making a ton of money, a ton of money. And it, that hole inside of me just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I remember sitting on my living room floor after realizing my apartment and they had left a butcher's knife on my bureau in my bedroom. I was over at a friend's and they had come in, climbed up a tree, went through a window. I was living in an old Victorian that had an apartment on the top and they left the butcher's knife on the bureau. Oh my God. And I remember just thinking, God's saying to me, Bill, I'm not going to watch over you anymore. You know, now everyone has a different belief in what yeah. God is. Right. At that time, I just felt like the karma is bad. And I kept using for at least another year or two. And other things happened, good things, bad things. And then I was struck sober April 18th, 1997. And that was the beginning of my life, really. Why do you mean? What do you mean when you say struck sober? I woke up and just knew I couldn't drink anymore and didn't know how to get sober. So I felt like something greater than myself had to restore me to sanity. And that was what happened on April 18th. I hear it in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, people talk about it once in a while. I shouldn't be promoting, you know, I'm not supposed to mention AA, but I could call it whatever it is. Yeah, but right. It, it saved my life. It yeah. saved life, you know. Um, yeah, we're not supposed to promote on radio or film or anything. Um, so that was a slip of the tongue. But it, there's other ways to get sober. It's just a, for me, what's worked for me is it's about a connection with my higher power, which I choose to call God. I'm not a I'm not a religious person, but mm -hmm. I'm a very spiritual person. Yeah. And I've had all these things happen that some people would say are coincidences. 
well, why can't a coincidence be a spiritual experience? Yeah. Just a word. Right. Like it God is. is just a word. Yeah, it's whatever just labels. You wanna, yeah, whatever you want to put on it. But I, I, I've had so many situations happen in my life that um, I feel were a type of divine intervention, not that mine were any greater than anybody else's. It was that I saw my world differently. I had a shift in my perception. So if I have a problem now, I have to remember because I do have spiritual amnesia. And it's a matter that on a daily basis, I have to remember, you know, who I really am and how did I get here. And part of that is, is if I have a problem, not focusing on the problem, but focusing on my relationship with my higher power. So if I focus on my relationship with my higher power and write out a gratitude list, I have a shift in perception around that problem. So I change how I look at the problem, which then changes the problem. Yeah. Because now I'm looking at it from a different mindset. Right. And that to me is the key to staying sober. But there is an old saying in in um in the rooms of recovery, we'll call it. Um most people dealing with this disease feel that they're the most important piece of shit in the room so that they're up here and they're down here. And what, what Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith discovered was that by talking to someone else who's dealing with the same issue, we become right-sized. Mm -hmm. The egos become right-sized. And what does ego stand for? Ease God out. Mm -hmm. Because the ego is only there out of fear. It's there to protect us. It's not a bad thing. It's to keep us from walking out in the middle of the road and getting hit by a car. Right. It's it's there for us to stand up for ourselves when we're being, you know, physically or emotionally abused. But at the same time, we have to kind of align it with the inner being of who we are to say to it, I got this. It's okay. I'm glad you're here. But I'm tapping into a power greater than myself that is within me. See, that's the thing. It's not something out there. It's already within. Mm -hmm. I just have to initiate it. Right. And to me, that's the paradox of life. You know, it's like some organized religions, and if it works for them, great. But, you know, they, they see it as being something outside of themselves. I don't believe that. I believe it is all within us, because if we're all supposed to be from the same higher power, yep. then we're all connected in one way or another. Yeah. And some people will say, well, that's foo-foo. That's this. Well, then that's your belief. That's okay. Right. Right. You know, um, you know, I remember on an all in the family episode, Edith Bunker decided to go to the Catholic Church with her friend mm -hmm. and Archie, who was a devout Protestant who never went to church. Right. Was very upset. They're going to they're going to try and convert her. And she simply said, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit. No, I love my religion. I just want to learn about others. Mm -hmm. And I wish everybody could just do that. Yeah. If we looked at ourselves as humanitarians, as as human beings, and not right, left, center, gay, straight, black, white, just kind of we're all here to we're all here to have a better experience of life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that's why we're here. So yeah. if I'm drinking, the signs are coming, but I'm not seeing them. Because I think right. they're always there. It's just a matter of whether or not you see them. Right. Yeah. And I, when I made my podcast episode about going sober, it was kind of to hold myself accountable in a way just to have it out there. But I thought, well, it's a very vulnerable thing. I'll put it out. And I said all the reasons that at the time that I felt like I had, was quitting, vanity was one, you know, uh, my health, obviously, you know, I had my daddy passed away. I just want to be healthy. Um, the, the fear and anxiety that would happen the day after an event where I knew people were taking pictures, people, you know, wedding reception, stuff like that. Mm. Oh God, you know, do, or am I drunk in the pictures? Do I look drunk in the pictures? I hope there's no pictures of anything, <laughs> you know, um, waking up the next morning. What did I say? What did I do? Blacking out? You know, there's so many reasons, but why do we feel like when we're around people, why don't you drink? Why do we feel like we have to be like, okay, first of all, 
<laughs> Let me get well, out my notebook. <laughs> think about it. When you first started drinking as a teen, if that's when you started, mm -hmm. you know, for myself, mm -hmm. it was about fitting in. Right. I think we always want to be liked. We always want to fit in. We feel more comfortable when we're drinking. That's how why I first started drinking. You know, yeah. my dad had had a heart attack and my mom had gotten hepatitis. Not this is years before I got it. And I watched her eyes roll up in the back of her head. And I heard my dad say, we lost her. And this was like a month or two after my dad had had a heart attack. The irony was um, in 2010, they both died within four months of each other. Oh my gosh. But back in 19, yeah, but she was, he, he died, he was 89 and it was heart stuff and she died in a car accident and she was still working at 85. Oh, okay? God bless still her. Still working. Um, so, but when you look back when I was 12 and my parents were, looked like I was going to lose both of them and a woman in my neighborhood had committed suicide who was a hardcore drinker, hard alcoholic. I saw her hammered. Um, and that's a whole other story. But then um, I started getting anxiety and feeling scared. And I remember in one weekend, there were like 15 people I hung out with. In one weekend, eight on Saturday, seven on Sunday, all got high and drunk for the first time. Why? And we had age difference. Some of them were nine and I was 12. Um, it was just, it was 1972, the woman who committed suicide her son became the first dealer in my neighborhood where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we all were kind of feeling anxious. 1972 was Vietnam. You know, there yeah. was Watergate, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Like today. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I remember someone said to me, Bill, smoke this and you'll feel better. And when I drank, it took away the feelings. Yeah. And that's why any of us do it. Mm -hmm. The University of Texas, I think it was Texas or Houston, did a big study years ago where they studied alcoholics. And what they decided, and once again, I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. you can probably Google it, was that the only difference between an alcoholic and what we call a normie, a normal you know, drinker or whatever, is that we're more sensitive to light, to sound, to smell, to our emotions to the people around us, to society, that were more sensitive beings. Mm. And they found that there was a difference in the brain. Wow. And that is when I, and I've been going to these meetings for 27 years. So I hear the stories that are all very similar. Everyone, you know, we're all different people, but we're all caught up in fear. You know, and how do we deal with it if we're feeling this way? Where someone else might be like, Bill, why are you afraid of that? Why are you reacting that way to what that person said to you? I mean, me drunk at weddings, not a good thing. You know, all bets were off on I could, you know, on who I was going to sleep with was totally different. You know, my God. Um, and I crossed the aisle several times. But anyway, no, I'm <laughs> kidding. Half kidding. But, uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to lose control of that. I don't make those. I mean, my character today is totally different. Mm -hmm. I'm a man of integrity and I can say that and, and, and mean it. Yeah. I think twice before I make a decision or I call members of my spiritual posse. And that's what I did when I went to weddings sober. I carried a list with me of seven names and phone numbers that I could call if I started feeling a little quirky. Okay. I just walk, and now it's even easier because back then it was a pay phone I had to go and right. find. But now I could just take my cell and I walk away from the wedding and I talk to somebody to get me back on track or they say like, Bill, you know, you need to do this and this. Now when I go to a wedding, if it's people I know, I end up becoming part of the wait staff just because I want to be busy. I'm like carrying out trays and it's all waiters and me, you know, and people be like, what's Bill doing? He just has to be busy. So but do you get triggered then? Is that why you feel? No, like you know what it is? Because you're listening to those drunken conversations and I want to be at the wedding. But I, it's it's also when you get sober, not everybody, but most of us, we look at the importance of being of service. Mm -hmm. Being of service will keep you sober. Yeah. Yeah. 
Like you don't have to do any recovery if you don't want to. You, it's a good thing to because you learn more, more about yourself and you make an amends as needed and, and you're doing it with a group of people. But I've known people that have gotten sober through, they do therapy, church, and volunteering because it gets you out of your head. Yeah. And you're giving back. And whenever you're giving back, you feel good. It's a win-win. Right. Yeah. You know? And and I do want to mention this one thing about overcoming fear, because this really helped me. If you're feeling the fear, if you can re remember on the other side of that fear, when I walk through it, there's more self-love. Oh, that's beautiful. So when I when I can remember, oh, you know what? I have this awful fear about this. If I walk through it, I'm going to love myself more. There's more self-love waiting for me on the other side. And if I have that fear again, it'll never be the same as it is right now yeah. because I will have broken it, you know, and it yeah. makes a difference in how we live our lives. I, without getting into politics, I look at the way of the world and there's a lot of fear of why oh, people gosh, yes. go to war, why yeah. they make fun of each other, why they do this, why they do that. And and I think it's all based on fear because I think there's only two emotions, fear and love. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself, am I making this decision out of fear or am I making it out of love? Right. Yeah. And then I make a decision on that. Marianne Williamson, the author, she made a statement one time I heard and I just loved it. She said, if all world leaders and business you know, like conglomerates would ask one question before they made a major decision. And that question is, how would this affect the children? Mm. Just in general. Can you imagine if we lived our lives that way? Well, you know what? This is like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do, how would this affect the children? Right. I think yeah, people would make really... very, it's powerful. Yeah, it is. Or just stop and think, period. Before yeah. anything. Just stop and think before you get on Twitter with a rant or say something that's going to be offensive. Yeah, people just need to not be knee jerk all the time. I've heard some people say it's been a good day if I didn't tell somebody to, you know, F off. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, that's your gauge. Wow, that's your that's your gauge. You didn't tell somebody to, you know, go to hell. I mean, my God. I think somebody needs to do some meditation, and prayer, you know. There's a crystal. Um, yeah, it's so another you, big part, too. You So you lived in Boston, and you're a huge sports fan of Boston. Why did you move? Why did you leave? Well, it, it, I was four years sober. I was writing, and um, I picked up a manager out here in Los Angeles. Okay. And, um he said to me, Bill, um, and I have a writing partner at the time, and he said, Bill, one of you has to be out here. So I moved out here two weeks before 9-11. So I moved out here, 9-11 happened, and I thought about moving back a few times, but now, no. I mean, I've had friends die. They've moved away. They, my, Both my parents are gone. My sister's there, who I love and adore her. So I'd like to try and get back more often. My goal is to be bi-coastal. That's always been my goal. Yeah. When my parents were alive, I'd go back two and three times a year because we were very close. Mm -hmm. you know? And then in 2010, he died. And then my mom, you know, was killed in a car accident. So, so it, um, yeah, I don't go back much anymore. I haven't been back since 2019. Oh, wow. Because we had COVID, you yes. know. Yeah, you got to get back there. Yeah, I do want to go back. I miss Fenway Park. I miss my sister. Um, I miss the Charles River. I miss being able to walk from the south end all the way to the north end. Yeah. You know? And and the food, the seafood. Yes. Just anywhere. Seafood yes. here in LA is like, <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I've been to visit my cousin a few times in Boston, and the food is amazing. Go to the north end. Oh, yes. God, Italian food there. Yeah, no, and I I mean, I just love sports. I always have. I was raised, um, you know, my dad coached when I was playing sports as a kid. And and um, it's just something, I don't know, I played a lot. And uh, there's something that is really familiar about it now. Like the Celtics are in the playoffs. 
The Bruins yes. lost last night six to one and very upset. You know, yeah. the Red Sox are winning. <laughs> it's just what you do. It's like you can take the boy out of Boston, but you can't take Boston out of the boy. That's right. Yeah. Their fans are die hard. I love it. I think that's awesome. So are you a sponsor for people that are quitting? Um, I have been. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'd say maybe I have one sponsee. We don't really talk anymore. That's what happens sometimes. Like my sponsor has like 30 sponsees. It's ridiculous, you know? So I've chosen to right now, I think I'm much better as a, a member of someone's spiritual posse yeah. than being a sponsor. I right. really do feel that um, I'm much better at doing that and building friendships that way. Um some of my sponsees in the past have become some of my best friends. Yeah, that's I don't, awesome. I don't formally sponsor them anymore. In the literature for the program I'm a part of, there's no mention of being a sponsor. That's interesting. In the main book. Right. None. So it's about if you have 10 days, you can take someone through the book or through the steps who have nine days. And you can still do it with anybody else. But what they advise is you work the 12 steps. And by the time you've done that, you're ready to help take someone else through them. Right. And let me tell you, those 12 steps will truly change a person completely. Some people have spiritual awakenings from them because you're being rigorously honest. You're looking at you know, cleaning house, keeping your side of the street clean, making amends, being of service, um, it, 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 you know, understanding that meditation is a, it's a practice. Mm -hmm. There's a million different ways to meditate because right. people are like, I can't meditate. I don't know how to do it. My mind. That's me. That's me. Yeah. I always say that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know what it is? And everybody has a different opinion on it, but it's just being still for a certain period of time. It could be five minutes. I usually, I take my iPhone and I set it for seven minutes because seven is a spiritual number Okay. in my head. So mm -hmm. I sit and sometimes I just sit and follow my thoughts. Sometimes I just sit in my backyard and I watch the squirrels and I watch the hawks and I watch the, the, cat, the feral cats and my dog <laughs> and just take it in. Um, I'll read. I when I go to meditate, I usually add prayer to it, and I also do readings. Like I have a lot of books I read, um, like anything by Michael Beckwith, who runs the Agape International Spiritual Center, which is the second that, yeah. best thing I ever did. He wrote a book called Spiritual Liberation. Okay, I've read it four times. I love books. And, yeah, and if you go to agapelive.com, you can go into their archives and listen to his talks and the okay. music. I mean, like Stevie Wonders, usually in the front row, you know, gets up and, and performs. I've seen Van Morrison play there. You know, I mean, it's all these different. And he's been around for a while, I think now, maybe 30 years. But it's it's based on new thought. So you could have somebody Jewish on one side of you, Hindu on the other, a Baptist in front of you and a Catholic behind you. It's all... I love that. That's, yeah. I big, know that big. every everybody's experience is different. Everybody's day, divine day, yeah, is is you know individual to them. But is there like, if somebody was thinking about going sober, is there a first step? Do you think? Yeah, yeah. I think the, the first thing is. Remember, you're doing, yes, you might be doing it for family and friends and whatever, but you're essentially doing it for you. You know, it's a paradox. It's a selfish program of being of service. So it's, it's really kind of sitting down and looking at your life and being rigorously honest. Is this getting in my way? And is it affecting how I interact with others? Um, my finances, my my health, all those things come into play. And the first step I would say is go on Google, find some AA meetings in the area or some Zoom AA meetings, which are all over the world now. Right. COVID. I mean, I've spoken on Zoom meetings in the UK. I did it quite a bit over COVID. 
So go and just, you know what, give yourself 30 days. Just say, you know what, I'm not going to drink for 30 days and I'm going to go to meetings at least three or four times a week. So with Zoom, there's no excuse. Yeah, right. You know, and find <laughs> one, yeah, like find one that's in person. Um, and if it doesn't feel right, find another one. You know, it's like I had a friend who had an alcoholic husband and we were talking about Al-Anon and I said, if you try it, Al-Anon. And she went, yeah, I went to a meeting. It wasn't for me. And I'm like, you went to one meeting? <laughs> yes. I had another guy say to me, this was a therapist. Bill, I heard AA is all about Jesus. And I went, what? I said, I've never heard Jesus' name mentioned once at an AA meeting at all. There's even a chapter in the big book that says, we the agnostics. So if you don't believe in, because a lot of people were, you know, had bad experiences with organized religion, whether they were Protestant, yeah, Catholic, right, yes. Jewish, whatever it was, they didn't believe what was being jammed down their throats for whatever reason. Yes. Um, so they, when they hear the word God, they'll, oh, no, but no. <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> no more. It's a higher power of your own creation. So some people say the word dog because it's God spelled backwards. Right, right. You know, other people use the ocean or Mother Nature. I believe it's like the energy of the universe. Right. And it's kind of a mixture of everything. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm not, you know, the teachings of Jesus are incredible. I'm just not a Bible guy. Yeah. I'm not, you know, um, I think if he came back and saw what people were doing in his name, he wouldn't be able to stop throwing up. Right. Yes. Yes. He'd be very upset. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> Jesus. I mean, some of these people are all about vengeance and revenge and total opposite of what his teachings were. Right. And he spent all this time in the desert and meditated and had an awareness and a consciousness and, and, um, you know, was probably a true healer in a lot of ways. You know, I'm going to share this because I think it's important. You know, I'm gay and, um, and, my dad read his Bible every single day. He mm -hmm. was a hardcore Republican Baptist, okay? <laughs> oh, and, my. Seriously. And when he found out I was gay, he sent my mother away. I was like 24 when I came out. And and my mom calls me, your father asked me if you were gay. And I said, you'll have to ask Bill. And he's like, so that's like, yes, right? So she goes, she goes, and he wants to talk to you, so you have to come down to the Cape. So they lived on Cape Cod. Okay. So I go down there and he had sent her away and he was watching a Red Sox game. And I walked in and he goes, we need to talk about your problem. And I said, no, we need to talk about your problem. And he went, <laughs> he went what? And he goes, come on, let's go for a ride in the car. So here's a guy, Republican, conservative, Baptist, read his Bible every day, went in on D-Day, right? In World War II. This guy walked the talk. Yeah. And we're driving in the car and he says, listen, I don't have to agree with your lifestyle, but you're my son and I love you no matter what. So we went back and watched the rest of the Red Sox game together. So over that. the years, it was funny. You'd hear me mention a name. Like if I said, oh, I was talking to Don today. And who's Don? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> he'd corner my female friends. Do you love my son? Well, yeah, I do. No, do you love my son? Oh, my God. You know, it was crazy. So I had a partner die of AIDS in 92. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was out in Ohio. I had sent him home um, for his birthday, which was Christmas Eve. And he was in a wheelchair. And, my, and when he went into a coma, who did I call? My dad. Because he practiced the teachings, the true teachings of Jesus. And... He, when I moved out to L.A., he called me out of the blue one day and he said, Bill, I've been through the Bible numerous times and I don't see where you're going to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I've been doing research. <laughs> yeah, I was like, thanks for sharing. You know, it was so funny. But he was and this is the thing that I, I, I stress because I'm very liberal. He was a Republican. My mom was a Republican. My sister was liberal. And we had honest conversations. We appreciated each other's opinions. We rarely ever, if we fought about it, it wasn't even a fight. Yeah. You know, maybe our voice got a little loud and then we would settle down. And, and minds were changed. 
I changed my mind about a candidate, and so did my dad. Mm. Because the love was there first. Right, right. You know, That's and nothing's worth message. it. Yeah, the other stuff's just not worth it, you know? And in and and I quit confirmation when I was 12, because that's when I was drinking and dragging. <laughs> and I'm listening to this going, what am I doing here? Too much dogma, too many dark, too much doctrine. And he he was hurt and he respected it. And, you know, in my being more new thought, he was curious about it. So we'd have these God conversations all the time. And he was Baptist. Right, right. But he, he understood the unconditional love that you have for a family member. Yeah, he was an amazing man. I, I, I miss him and my mom every day. Um, mm. I was really blessed to have, because other friends of mine that might have come out being gay, their families disowned them. And they really missed out on a lot, I think, in doing that because of their ego. Out of fear. Right. Yeah, the parents missed out. Yeah, because that's just terrible. I couldn't imagine yeah. shunning my child. No, and they interpreted even... dogma and doctrines without understanding the love for the family should come first. You know, a lot of people would say God and country. My dad would be, it would be family, God and country. Mm -hmm. um, when I got sober, he was proud. They had their faults like anybody else, but they overall, I was, and we grew up lower middle class. He worked his ass off. Yeah. You know, and instilled a strong work ethic in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to be careful though, because every time I call him, first thing out of his mouth, you making any money? <laughs> making any money? Every time, first thing, I'd be like, oh, God. Well, at least he didn't specify a certain amount. <laughs> no, he didn't. But yeah, it, it it was. But that's just who he was. He grew up during the depression. He'd want me to make money. My mom too. They both, you know, and they'd sit down together um, once a week and do the bills together at the kitchen table. They would. It was a team. Yeah, they were a team. They made my Halloween costumes when I was growing up. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Sixty four years they were married. Oh, that's so beautiful. So tell people how they can find you, like your books, everything. When, oh, okay, yeah. Wherever you can be found. Um, well, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and places like that. Um, I have a film coming out that I have to mention because yes. it, it deals with some of the things we've just discussed. Perfect. Um, it's kind of a divine comedy, and it's called Paradise, A Town of Sinners and Saints. And it's a musical comedy based on a stage production that ran here in L.A. for a long time and also in Austin, Texas, went okay. to a playhouse there. Um, it's irreverent, it's fun, and it's heartwarming. Oh, There's a love great that. love story in it. There's um, 21 original songs, mostly bluegrass, <laughs> um, written by my composer, Cliff Wagner, Will be um, it's on Zumo right now, which is X U M O. It'll be on Tubi on May fifteenth, and then it'll be on Amazon Prime and Google TV on June fifteenth. Oh my gosh, how exciting! Yep, and the mu the soundtrack will be put on out on about a hundred and fifty platforms, um, probably the beginning of June, from Pandora to Spotify, whatever. It's just a fun show. It, it's um, the lyrics are hysterical. It got rave reviews out here. Um, we poke fun at some things. We don't make fun of anyone. Yeah. And and it's really about how we we shouldn't judge a book by its cover because there's some there's some surprises in it and there's some great arcs with the characters that you know um, and it raises some eyebrows. But it it really is, I'd use the word irreverent. We got a PG-14 rating through the language. <laughs> no real violence or anything like that. It's just fun. Grass with violence. I know. And, it, and it's, it's basically stage meets film and reality TV. 
So when you see it, you're going to have that feel. Wait a minute, is this a stage show? Oh, wait, this is a film. Wait a minute, why is reality, what's happening here? And you'll know throughout the story of why it turns to those three. Oh my gosh. When is it? When does it come out? It's out right now on okay, Zumo, okay. which is X-U-M-O. There's commercials, but they're very short. And you okay. don't, and, and Zumo's free. And then it's on Tubi. And then Amazon Prime, you can rent or buy it. Um, I think it's like nine ninety nine to buy it on um, June fifteenth. And then Google TV. And it's funny, every the industry is changing so much, and streaming services are taking a big part of it. And some are using ads, and some aren't. Combine just those four platforms, that'll be four hundred and sixty one million monthly subscribers wow that'll have access to the film oh my gosh that's so exciting so it's I'll all about marketing sure. and vr <laughs> well i will look for it for sure and watch it and then i'll i'll reach out to you and let you know i saw it but yeah. Oh my gosh, Bill, this has been the best conversation. You are just a delight. You have oh, so you. much information, but you put it in such a good tangible way, which I always love because then it's just easier for people to take it all in and, and use it, use it. In no, I way. agree. And, and, you know, if you're have if you think you're having a problem with alcohol, the odds are you probably are. Most normal drinkers don't question their drinking. Yeah. If you're questioning it, explore. You know, and, and it and it is one day at a time because right. that's all any of us have. And we, it, it, I could walk out from this talk right Don't. now and get hit by a bus. <laughs> Knock you know? on wood. One of my dearest friends, um, he swam in the ocean every Sunday three miles, part of a swimming group. He bice, He cycled all the time. He watched his weight and his health, and he was in good shape. He saved up his money, was going to retire from this big entertainment management firm. He'd saved over a million dollars, right? Because he also gambled. He was very good at it. And um, diagnosed in May with stem cell leukemia, died in December. Oh, my gosh. Never got to retire formally. Oh. So yeah. when we live in outside of today... It's okay to have dreams and goals, but really bring it back to when you're going through a hard time. When, when you're caught in worry about the future, just remember it's Thursday. Yeah, that is great advice. Yeah, we, we all think have we Thursday. have more time than we have. Nobody knows. Nobody no, knows. If, this, if, this, if, if there's a family member that you truly love and for some reason you haven't talked to them in a while, give them a call, send them a text, say, hey, just thinking of you. Yeah. You know, it really, it just makes a difference. Pat that dog, you know, smile at somebody on the street. By us living that type of life, we make other people's lives easier. Right. And your own. And your own. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Bill, thank you so much. It was so thank good you. talking to you. And uh, I will be in touch very soon. Sounds great. And you have a, a wonderful rest of your Thursday. <laughs> You too. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Bye.